going to continue here with the golden age of cars, depending on who you ask. Some people will say it's the 50s. Others will say it's the 60s. However, there's a consensus that it's definitely not the 70s because of so many changes by car manufacturers that are made that in some way take away the purity of what all the fun was about in the 50s and the 60s. Before we get into this presentation, we have to have some understanding of what a four-cylinder engine is. A four-cylinder engine, you'll know them because you'll see these spark plugs. One, two, three, four. These spark plugs are in this particular area, and that is what sparks gasoline to create an explosion, forcing these pistons down. Eventually these pistons are connected to a rear, and the rear is eventually connected to your wheels, and that's what gets the car to move. Let's take a look at this quick video. Today, the internal combustion engine is used in motorcycles, automobiles, boats, trucks, aircraft, you see the explosion right here. So that's the uh, four-cylinder engine. And the 50s and 60s, the eight-cylinder engine is uh, one of the things that's really creating a car culture because Americans are figuring out ways to modify this, make it faster. And the one thing about this motor is it's definitely not environmentally friendly. When we look at this 1970 Toyota Corolla, it's a four cylinder, one, two, three, four, which means it's half the motor, which means it's not as fast. However, it is fuel efficient. So keep that in mind. Um, the one thing that the car culture does is it creates this common bonding experience among Americans, primarily males here. In this image, we see the males hanging out at a A&W. Is that what that is? Yes, it is an A&W. And they are enjoying American fast food, showing off their cars. How do we know that? Because this individual has decided to take his hood off the car so you can see the modifications. This guy seems to be very interested in what this individual has under the hood. Anyway, uh, this show, Happy Days, was made in the 70s. It's about life in the 70s. I just wanted to play the first part of this. Sunday, Monday. Notice everybody hanging out at the Arnold's, which is the scene that they're trying to recreate here. I just wanted to point that out. That's the American common culture. Of course, the American common shared culture for automobiles would only be successful if you have suburban growth, which is going to take place after World War II when there is a huge increase in the birth rate. To add further um, suburban growth, you see Eisenhower, the president of the United States, put money aside to create the interstate, which is a highway system that is going left to right or east west or north south, up down, whatever you want to say. Uh, it's this connected highway system that is going to provide access to the suburbs, which is going to be dependent on cars. Here we have Eisenhower trying to promote his interstate. And this is going to lead us to Route 66. Route 66 used to be the old interstate, which was one road that would take you from Chicago to LA. So if you wanted to get to the Pacific Ocean, at some point you have to get on Route 66. And this highway would be replaced once Eisenhower's interstate would come into existence and it was finally completed. That Route 66 definitely was a place where money was made to try to get travelers into roadside attractions, into stores, into their motels, into their restaurants. And of course, all of this is what the movie Cars is about. Let's take a look at this clip. Look at that. Oh yeah? Yeah. 
40 years ago, that interstate down there didn't exist. Really? Yeah. Back then, cars came across the country a whole different way. How do you mean? Well, the road didn't cut through the land like that interstate. It moved with the land, you know? It rose, it fell, it curved. Long ago, the world found in your building. So the whole point behind cars is that this individual is supposed to represent modernity, progress, that interstate, which leaves all of that particular town just in the past. So there you go. I've ruined cars for you. Anyway, uh, if you are thinking about segregation, well, at some point, you have to look at the Negro Traveler's Green Book, which is pretty much a pamphlet designed to tell black travelers where they can go, whether it's a hotel, motel, or a restaurant, and where they're going to find some safety. There's a game on the site that uh, gets you to think about the Green Book. The game is fairly easy to play. You have to go on each space and you have to make it from your place of residence to this place within six travel days. Each space is an hour of travel time. The problem is if you were to go to Bob's, Bob's might be unfriendly. They might call you names, they might harass you, they might refuse to serve you. So, the Green Book was designed by Victor Hugo to tell black travelers where to go. And in some cases, you would have to go 20 minutes out your way to go to the gas station and then 20 minutes back. Or you risk just going to the one gas station that might refuse service. So, if each space is an hour and you have to make it to here by day one, one, two, three, you have to add two, four, five, it would take you six hours, however, because you have to go to the friendly establishments, you're adding 20 minutes to get there, 20 minutes back, 30 minutes to get there, 30 minutes back, 15 minutes to get there, 15 minutes back. You would be over the allotted travel time simply because you were trying to find safety on any of these particular roads. Vice had a series called Abandoned, and if you were to look at this particular uh, series, you would find one on Route 66, which takes you along that particular highway, and it is a, another reference to the good old days of America's past. Let's take a look at the car summary, so I want you to go into your notes, see what you come up with. Here's my list. Make sure you take note of the size of the motors because this is definitely going to be an issue in the 1970s when you start to see American consumers forced because of a gas crisis because of federal legislation to have cars that are just more fuel efficient more Americans more cars you need more roads you have to have all of this in order to have a birth in the suburbs which is the next topic suburban growth For suburban growth, first thing you want to take note of is the Levittown, which is the first suburb. This is a geographical model that's supposed to show you how America has developed. It starts off with a CBD, a central business district, and as this gets a significantly higher population, people move out and they go into what eventually will become the suburbs. Sometimes that creates a new central business district. People move, and then you have yet another suburb, and the process sometimes repeats. Anyway, since this is about suburban growth using South Brunswick, we cannot talk about suburban growth without talking about malls. And the first shopping mall for 1956 was a way to try to get people to shop, to change some of the patterns of behavior with regard to shopping, trying to just consolidate everything into one area, trying to expand on the department store of the 20s and trying to create something new for suburban shoppers. 
Look at that right there. 1,500 shopping malls were built. Becomes a place for teenagers to hang out. The question here, are malls becoming extinct? Can suburbs exist without any places to shop? And we see the current state, which is a reversal of this particular slide, where we now start to see dead malls. Abandon also did a series on dead malls, or an episode. Declining American culture. Anyway, getting back to suburban growth, I want you to think about this question. Do people feel comfortable around their own, or are they okay having different groups living with them? This is an image of Oak Tree Road, which is a de facto segregated community in New Jersey, which seems to have a high Indian population. Why do I bring that up? Well, because suburbs develop and they are developing differently, especially in the state of New Jersey, where you start to see a main street, which is something that you might see in most central business districts. Um, this is downtown Princeton. Certain suburbs are trying to develop a town center type feel to try to mimic the main streets of the past, but the main streets of the past have some history that certain suburban communities coming into existence in the 50s and 60s just lack. Another image of suburban growth. Keep in mind that interstate allowing this to boom and expand. And South Brunswick, right here, about an hour from New York and about an hour from Philadelphia, which makes it geographically significant simply because it's right there in the middle between both of those major CBDs or central business district. And let's see, the person who had this presentation was asked to look at some of the yearbooks. These are just some images from presentations over the years, trying to show you some of the suburban growth. Now, going back to the question I asked earlier, which you're probably wondering, why would he ask such a question about that? Um, migration from India really starts to kick up in the 1980s as a result of some of these restrictions on immigration being removed. And you start to see the number of people coming over from India really starting to increase in this particular time here which is going to definitely impact where people go. And you see individuals from India going primarily to Edison and into the South Brunswick area. Carteret as well starts to see some of the numbers of its Indian population increase. Looking at this image here, the Tuchin, which is close to Edison, you see a lot of green spread throughout the area, whereas a town with a high Hispanic population, Perth Amboy over here, and I would say this is going into New Brunswick. So you see a lot of de facto segregated places in New Jersey. Suburban growth, what's your summary? Here are my thoughts on the central business district, how you know suburbs developed, the Asian migration to New Jersey, and a school as a place for teens to find entertainment, which is being replaced by social media.